Thanks, Barbara, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. So as, as Barbara just mentioned, I'm going to take the perspective of applying NGS as a means to develop a pipeline of drugs. But I think you'll see that the concepts that we've been hearing all this, all this morning and this afternoon just now in this session um, apply even in the context of taking the approach to develop drugs in the pipeline. So when we discuss precision medicine, we're really leveraging our understanding of tumor or cancer biology, the um, identification of predictive and PD biomarkers, and applying that in a translational medicine setting. And the whole aim of this is in the context to deliver better patient selection and better outcomes for patients. And the idea is that this will result in more efficient clinical development, improved benefit risk, and stronger value pro uh, proposition for all precision medicine stakeholders. To have ideal success in precision medicine, we really have to think end to end when we're thinking about the drug development paradigm, starting with discovery and identifying those predictive biomarkers utilizing those to either select or stratify patients in our clinical studies, developing the validated assays that we've been discussing today, and having coincidental registration of both the drug and the diagnostic. But a key component to this is also the access piece, and we've heard a little bit about that today. It's not just having the assay available for patients, but also that that assay is reimbursed. So really thinking that end-to-end -end approach and how we can deliver precision medicine. We know this path to precision medicine because this has been how we've been practicing precision medicine over the course of the last 10 or so years. However, I think what we are hearing now that it is going to be increasingly important to have more comprehensive data on patient samples such that there is a better um, identification of patients for different studies, different clinical trials, whether they be umbrella or basket studies, if, as we've just been discussing, as well as ultimately for treatment decisions for patients in, in clinical practice. But there are many challenges to precision medicine, and Lillian has just touched on a number of these. Um, we've, we've already heard about tumor heterogeneity, the complexity of the, the molecular cas uh, signaling cascades as well as mechanisms of resistance that will emerge. There's the clinical trial feasibility, the incidence or prevalence of a given marker, the frequency of that marker, and as well as the consent of the patient and what you can use the, the sample for in terms of testing. We also know that um, having contemporaneous development of companion diagnostics adds to the complexity of precision medicine development. And we've, been, we've heard today about assay validation, the sensitivity specificity of those assays, as well as the pre-analytical steps that need to be taken into consideration. And finally, just the integration of development of drugs and diagnostics together in the development of a drug program is, is not exactly that, that straightforward. This is even more difficult when you're taking into, con un into consideration rare patient populations. And in the case of non-small cell lung cancer, we know that there are a number of uh, populations where the frequency of the mutation is found at about 1 to 2%. And here I'm describing for you um, a phase two study that GSK has been running, which is the BRAF113928 study. And this is a study that was being run in for our BRAF inhibitor in um, BRAF V600E positive non-small cell lung cancer patients. In this particular study, we did capitalize on local testing as a means by which to identify patients eligible for the study. If we had had to conduct this study in the traditional path, prospectively screening patients with a validated assay, it would be impossible to run this particular trial. And so there has to be a better way of identifying patients eligible for treatment 
and it allows us to develop drugs for those patients where there is a strong unmet medical need using a different paradigm. I don't think I need to go through this for the, this particular audience, but there's also the conundrum of having insufficient tissue to actually conduct testing under the traditional paradigm where you have one test for one biomarker. It's so therefore, it becomes increasingly important to have comprehensive tests that allow us to look at a multitude of markers in a standard manner at once to be able to determine patient treatment or triage patients to different clinical studies. So the path to developing targeted agents in lung cancer, for instance, needs to take into consideration a number of different factors. Certainly the mo molecular characterization of the tumors, the different segments of lung cancer um, as, from a histological standpoint, the drug development paradigm that is evolving all the time, and ultimately we need to be able to de deliver um, products of value for all of the patients that we're trying to, to treat. So one thing to take into consideration is a new shift in the paradigm for developing companion diagnostics. We need to move away from the multi multiple single plex assays for single biomarkers. We need to have assays that have lower sample input and maybe even can be applied to alternative sampling types that are not just tumor samples. We need to have platforms that can be utilized and accessed on a global scale. This is particularly important when you're in the, in the pharma world developing drugs for, for patients all across the world. The regulatory path, which is evolving, needs to be evolving on a global scale. And finally, there needs to be commercial viability for those assays as well. So I'm going to spend the remainder of my talk describing for you a um, collaborative multi-pharma network that GSK has been working on over the past um, 18 months. At this moment in time, this is a joint venture with Pfizer, GSK, and Thermo Fisher Life Technologies with other pharma partners who are coming on board to learn more about the initiative and participate. The idea is that we engage multiple precision medicine stakeholders. That includes, at this time, the NCI, academia, different advocacy groups, as well as the regulatory agencies and the payer um, network. We aim to enable standardized and shared screening between the pharma companies that enables more efficient clinical development and also a more cost-effective clinical development, particularly in the context of identifying rare patient populations. Part of this network is also to work with the different health authorities and regulatory agencies so we can continue to advance the regulatory framework to support the development of these types of assays as well as the drug development in this context. And essentially, help to support the dissemination of next generation sequencing in the marketplace that will increase the access of um, precision medicines for patients. So this is an illustration of the approach that we're taking. Um, at this moment in time, because it's um, G GSK and Pfizer, the two pharma partners involved, we are actively working to develop and validate a companion diagnostic that is based on a multi-analyte next-generation sequencing assay. The panel contains genes that are relevant to our current existing pipelines and also takes into consideration other um, markers of interest that are known to be part of the different signaling pathways that these drugs um, will target. The treatment trials are currently ongoing for, for the, the drugs that are in the first pass, pass of the development of this assay, and we're working actively with the FDA to determine the, the best path forward for developing this um, particular assay as a companion diagnostic. Moving forward, the aim is to establish a master screening network 
um, ultimately to have a master screening protocol that would enable multiple pharma partners to benefit from a screening network of laboratories that are conducting testing using standard operating procedures. And this would be on a global scale. It would not just be based in the US. So what does this do? It takes into consideration that end-to-end -end concept of the delivery of precision medicine. Not only does it allow standardization for screening in our clinical trials, but it also creates a network that enables the commercialization of tests in the future because you still have, you have those labs that are also available to conduct testing for patients once these drugs become available on the marketplace. So the assay that we have chosen is based on the Oncomine um, cancer panel that is the assay that's being used in the NCI match um, clinical trial that has been described already today. However, we're, because we need to take into consideration not only the need to generate evidence in our clinical studies, but also to develop an assay that is commercially viable, we are proposing that we would utilize the Oncomine um, cancer panel of 150 genes in our early development studies. And at the point of which we have um, generated the evidence that a biomarker is um, viable for a particular association with efficacy to a drug, that we would switch to a, a smaller panel that would be validated for both registration and commercialization. And this is, really gets at um, the, the ability to implement this kind of testing on a much broader scale um, that is commercially viable for labs that want to adopt this kind of testing, but at this moment in time, the cost still may be prohibitive. This also takes into consideration regions of the world where um, testing of this nature really needs to be established in a much more um, specific manner. When we set out to, um, look, to establish this, this project, um, there were a number of factors that we took into consideration in terms of establishing which assay we would go with and, and which test provider we would go with. And this was also conducted under a request for information. And there were a number of main areas that, that we um, focused on particularly as it related to the sample input, the preparation and library preps, the sequencing detection method, um, what the, um, the analytics and bioinformatic requirements would um, be, as well as the reporting. And uh, obviously, we also have to take into consideration the turnaround time, not only for um, being able to enroll patients onto our studies, but also to think about that in the context of when this becomes a, commercially, a commercial product, you want to have a test that provides an answer for patients in a, in a reasonable time such that patients can gain access to treatments as quickly as possible. Oops. Another component we've taken into consideration and we're actively discussing with the FDA is how do you address the aspect of bias when you enroll patients onto studies based on a local test. And the beauty of um, this paradigm is taking into consideration multiple pharma partners who might participate in a screening network, each of whom are interested in different biomarkers for different tumor types, or even if it is in the same tumor uh, or same disease indication, that um, you have the um, ability to capitalize on the mutual exclusivity of different biomarkers. And what that creates is a pool of samples that are all screened in the same manner under standard processes. And if one patient has a BRAF mutation, that sample is negative for many other mutations and vice versa. So it starts to address some of the issues related to bias as it as, um, is concerned by the FDA when developing companion diagnostics. It doesn't address all the issues of bias, but it certainly um, starts to mitigate that as an issue. And this is one of the um, 
the components that we have been discussing. The other element that we've been discussing with the agency is the ability to provide all data that will be generated from this kind of test and what that means in terms of labeling claims. So obviously, if you are generating um, data that demonstrates clinical utility, then your clinical claim, which will be approved under the context of a PMA, will be available on the label. However, we don't want to minim uh, limit or minimize the remaining data and how, how that could be used in the context of understanding much more about patient efficacy in the context of these different treatments. And so we have also been discussing with the FDA ways to um, have claims that are both clinical and analytical that allows um, access to all the data available. And so at the end of the day, um, we are working with the FDA to establish a, no a novel regulatory framework, um, as I've just described, that takes into consideration both the PMA predictive or clinical claims, as well as um, being able to access the analytical claims. And what this ultimately will do is allow us to move from the one test, one drug to one test, multiple drugs. Um, we want to be able to work across not, of, not only the FDA, but engaging other health authorities, because in Europe, um, this is um, becoming an area of great interest, and as well as Japan and other health authorities are also moving um, in a direction that see, is, is seeking to gain more regulation for companion diagnostic tests. So in summary, I think we can all agree that the medical field is evolving, that advances in technology are leading to um, our ability to gain greater access to huge amounts of data. Also, the technology is allowing us to generate comprehensive data in much smaller patient samples. And so ultimately, the information revolution is being brought to the patient. And what this is enabling us to do is to have um, the ability to screen for multiple targets that will allow us to triage patients to many different clinical studies. And so the idea here is that we will have better identifications who, identification of patients who will be eligible for treatment with the aim to have improved benefit risk, better clinical outcomes, and more efficient drug development. And whilst the regulatory environment is evolving, we also have heard today that the payer environment is also evolving. And so we're hoping that this will become a, a much greater reality in the future. Thank you very much.